Hello, and welcome back to the Kingdom Come podcast, an OPCC original. I am Tyler Savainaya, and we are so blessed to have you with us here today. Um, if at any time that you feel called, that you need to speak to somebody, um, that you need to just get out there and be heard. Uh, we ask that you reach out to our discipleship director, Grant. Uh, you can email him at uh, grant at overlandpark.cc. He'd be happy to um, get you connected uh, or just listen to you um, however we can suit your needs best. But today on our show, we are joined by another member of the church, Mr. Jack Thank you, Jack, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've been, uh, you've been in Overland Park for. I, I know you've been coming to the church for a little bit over a year now. Is that right? Yeah. So came to the church <clears throat> end of June, early July of 2022, and then I've been in Overland Park since May 23rd of 2022. Okay, so you and your wife came. Very quickly after moving here from yes. Aggieville. Yep. Grand old, old College Station. Called College Station. Jeez. Um, and so you graduate, you, if I remember this correctly, you're an engineer? Systems engineer, yeah. I, I knew it. I remembered. <laughs> I got you. Um, and so you graduated. Uh, so, I, gosh. So just tell me a little bit about what it was like. Coming because you're a young guy. I mean, I'm I'm not old, but yeah. I'm a little bit older than you. I've uh, tell me what it is like because I haven't necessarily had to do this. Pick up where I've wherever you're from, go to college, and then uh, all the way across the country and come back. I've only had to go a few hours away. What what was that like? Right. Um, well, so honestly, for me, it wasn't that difficult. Um, so. I mean, we'll get into this in a bit, but grew up in New Mexico. Okay. Went to college in Texas, so already 12 hours distance from home. Uh, and then after five years out there, um, I got a job up here. And so it's just another 12-hour drive from all of her family. Um, and then it was actually moving closer to mine since I went up to Iowa. <laughs> so, And I got a brother in Nebraska. So it's real easy for me. I literally packed up my all of my stuff from my uh, house and her house and college station uh, in a six by 12 U-Haul in my truck. Yep. Um, we got rid of her car because it broke down. Uh, and we just one carved it up here one trip and, uh, immediately moved into an apartment, uh, that we found on a, a house, uh, hunting trip that my boss paid for. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it was pretty easy for me. She took some convincing to be okay with being away from family, but, uh, it's not that bad. Uh, playing, tr Plane rides are easy. I mean, it's direct uh, from here to Austin. And then mm -hmm. um, driving, I mean, 12 hours isn't too bad. Although no. It gets harder and harder the more I do it. Yeah. The, <laughs> the older you get, the, the worse the drive gets. Yeah. Is, uh, and you got to start pulling over and everybody's got to eat or right, right. use the bathroom. or uh, When you're alone, <laughs> so easy. You leave at five in the afternoon, get in at four in the morning because of a time change. Exactly. Real easy. I mean, two stops. Not yeah, bad. you don't have to do much. No, just five hour drive and play all the tunes guess, you need. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how in the world did you end up from college as an engineer? Because I mean Texas is large and right. industrial. How in the world do you get from Texas to Overland Park, Kansas? Well, so uh number one, I, I had two job offers, and one was in Austin. And then one was all the way up here. And the offer from up here came because uh my current boss um, got his PhD at A and M um, in the transportation side, um, and so uh, he basically went to my program coordinator and was just like, "Hey, we're looking for a systems engineer. Um, pass us any resumes." And then my program coordinator sent that out to us. I applied, uh, and I got both job offers. And I really didn't want to live in Austin. Uh, <laughs> you know, if your motto is "keep it weird," that's kind of I don't want to be there. Austin uh, and Portland, the same thing. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, it was, it was nice to get away from her family a little bit, uh, just for starting out, uh, get out on your own, really cleave. Um, cause, uh, all of her extended family is within 30 minutes of each other. So that's a lot. That can make it rough. And I wanted to have some like independence, uh, for her, from her side. Sure. My family's all over the place, so it doesn't even <laughs> matter. But yeah. So, uh, what kind of convincing 
did that take? Was it, um, trying to figure out like a way to best word this, but it, there, there's convincing in the way of opportunity and newfoundness and going out and adventuring on your own. But was there any, the, the holdback, was it family ties and roots or, um, was it more afraid of branching out and finding that newness in the adventure? Uh, so I fully embrace it. I love moving mm -hmm. and going different places. Uh, she really was tied to family ties. Uh, it's, she, it, she had never been more than three hours away from her mother, her entire life. And, uh, most of her extended family by proxy. Um, <laughs> but it, so in, in family is real big for them. I mean, every birthday in their family is a whole family function, right? Cousins, everything. So it was, it was pretty hard to, to, for her to leave that behind and see him. I, I fly her back a bunch. <laughs> so she, I mean, she probably goes maybe two months without seeing her mother before she flies back or mm -hmm. her mom comes up here. Um, and then, uh, on the other side of that, uh, it was, I kind of convinced her that she didn't want to live in Austin, which is a cell. And then that the only other offer was in Kansas. <laughs> uh, and then the, the, the other part of that was, um, my, company has uh, plans to make its way down to Texas. Sure. And I'm on the first boat back. Okay. And that's the deal well, I have. With that's you. the deal. So, that I mean, it's, it's a probably about a, you know, five year plan mm -hmm. to get us back, but uh, that's how I kind of, and who knows it. what happens in five years. Right. right? Exactly. You know, so, cause it, I mean, you're putting down roots obviously with a home church, right? We've right. got a kid on the way, uh, just buying a home, just, I mean, just yeah. buying a like, What's the economy going to be like in five years? Right. We don't like, right. Lord's taking care of all that. Exactly. <laughs> so I just really wanted to have the, you know, one-on-one -on -one aspect of mm. kind of really depending on each other, not family. Yeah, no, that's good. I think a lot of people miss out on having that aspect of branching out on your own and really seclude. And that doesn't mean like family's not important. It obviously right. is important, but there is an importance of like finding yourself mm -hmm. and needing to depend on the Lord and really grow that relationship. Cause right. if you're always dependent, that doesn't mean your family can't help you grow, but there are so many things that if you're not doing them on your own, the way, the way that you'll grow is much slower than if you were to do it on your own. Right. You've, it's, it's much like getting injured and like, or, or like you get a cut and like, sometimes that cut needs air. So mm -hmm. just rip the bandaid off. Sometimes you just have to have to go for it. Yeah. And you know, sometimes it's not that bad if you have family that is really good about giving you that space. Sometimes families don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, and you can kind of just tell, um, you know, I, I was within three hours of my parents up in West Des Moines. Mm -hmm. I probably saw them maybe twice a year Yeah, and they would just be driving through stay a night, you know? So they, they really were like, Hey, you just let us know when you want to see us. <laughs> like, we're not going to come crash your pad. That's good. So That's good. So tell me, because obviously a podcast and where we talk about our lives in the Lord. Right. It took you some, it took you convincing your wife some time to come to Kansas. But what did that look like in your walk and relationship with the Lord? Did it take, you know, was there communal sit down and prayer and, and walking through what, what, if anything, did you guys do at that time? Because I know, like, for me, I didn't know Jesus when I was in college. Right. Um, so during that time, it was a lot of, I guess, <laughs> private prayer. I know she was praying on it. I was praying on it individually. Um, we weren't married at the time. And we were also going into finals when all this got finalized. Because mm -hmm. it was the last two months when we made the decision uh, of college. And I already had a capstone project I was working on. And then we I had a bunch of early finals coming up. Um, so there was not a lot of communal prayer, which I guess kind of regret that, uh, <laughs> cause that probably would have helped smooth things over and make things a lot more clear. Um, and I certainly was not as strong in my walk, um, during that time. Um, I think moving up here has definitely been better, uh, for us, uh, especially in outreaching to new churches, um, and her coming into her own faith as well. Um, I think the distance from her mother helped her figure out what she really believed, mm -hmm. um, which was good. Um, and then her just continuously wanting to examine that helped me grow a little as well, uh, and make more commitments to helping out, uh, in church in general. 
uh, like either, you know, joining a discipleship group or helping out with kids ministry. Uh, I was kind of more, I guess, church, uh, since I had a church back home in New Mexico, I didn't have a lot of reason to go to one in Texas. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of watched podcasts and wasn't very involved. So, yeah, (laughs) you know, um, but moving up here, we kind of have to branch out to, to meet people like half of our community is people we met from the church. So, yeah, Yeah. no, that, and that's a big piece. So tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about that as well. Cause so you, you had a home church in New Mexico, you move to go to college and you're not going to church. You're just kind of doing everything on your own. Right. And then you come here and, and there's, you join this church and now, like you said, half, at least half the people you hang out with are, are from the church. How important are you viewing that community now and how much has it benefited your life and your walk with the Lord compared to not when you're in college doing any of those things that you don't, you, you wouldn't be able to live without now. Right. Um, the, the, the discipleship group is huge. Um, one for accountability, um, just for a lot of reasons, accountability is huge. <laughs> uh, you know, especially when you're slipping and struggling with uh, different vices, uh, and we all have it. Uh, but in college, there's really not a lot of people if you don't have that community to kind of keep you on going on the right path and keep you accountable to what you say you're going to do and what mm-hmm. you believe. Um, and uh, I don't know how much we want to get into that if we want to go deep or not. But however deep you want to go, dude. I mean, I I'm gonna give a graphic warning here. Uh, then sure, uh, but yeah, let's get into it. So, pretty addicted to porn in college, mm-hmm. uh, as most guys are. Um, and you know, when you don't have that uh group of accountability, um, especially a church accountability, uh, it, you kind of just push it away. Um, sure, uh, you'll get some clarity after the fact, but you always justify it in the in the uh act of doing it or seeking it out, right? Yes, um. And so you, it, it really just becomes a cycle of one, it's a habit that you constantly are doing then. And two, it, you, you keep telling yourself it's okay, or it's just an accident. No one holds you to it. So you keep doing it over and over. It becomes more and more and more okay. Mm-hmm. But if by having, you know, a group of good, good men that you can really rely on, um, that kind of, or at least that, you know, would keep you accountable, even if you're not talking intimately about this you still have that pressure um that's pretty big um because you can just look at that uh and just look at like oh man you know how would they view me if i were to bring if i were gonna yeah, do it's this not just tomorrow it's yeah. not just yourself it's not right. just you and sometimes it's more that in the lord it's it's right. you've got other people who are really pouring into your life that's what discipleship group is about right, right. it's about other men and women pushing you to be a better person in the Lord, not Mm -hmm. just a better person, but in the Lord and the things that he asks of us to do. And so it's, it's in a form, it is peer pressure, but it has the Lord's backing behind it. And Mm -hmm. so it's the accountability that you talked about in a righteous pathway. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's been huge. Uh, It certainly makes the struggle a lot less uh, and it, gives your mind a lot less reasons to kind of say it's okay and give in just Mm -hmm. for that moment. Um, which has been great. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's Um, good. And I think, I mean, it's hard. It's always hard to talk about. No, it is because it's when you just like when you hold it in, mm -hmm. it's not shameful. Mm -hmm. It's that thing that you can, Oh, it's something that you can rely on something that the body tells you it needs. But when you talk about it with other people, you do realize it is something that's shameful Mm -hmm. um, and that you don't feel like if you're not comfortable sharing it, that obviously tells you something. Right. Um, And that's a problem with where we're coming in today's society, especially as young men ourselves, you going to be a dad soon and having to deal with that thing that, you know, the addiction uh, uh, of the pornography and, and the things that are going on, but society is sitting here telling us today that it's okay. How do you feel knowing that you've got a child on the way and you're going to have to push them through this society? Terrified. Uh, (laughs) Right. Uh, 
I there is this there's a ray of hope, um, <clears throat> but terrified. There was a, a I think he's a senator or a congressman uh, that was on the news lately. Uh, that was actually they're they're shaming him for it now, but he brought up that he and his teenage son have an app that on his phone tracks in the background every site he goes to Mm -hmm. and will give an alert to people in his accountability group of what sites he's going to into if they need to be flagged. And that is a great way to make sure that even if you slip up, other people immediately know, like even the second you go to the URL, it'll send a notification to everyone else yeah, and they'll know. And that's not something you can hide. It, I'm a little nervous about that aspect because that's <laughs> that's a lot of data I'm giving away. Yeah. But, you know, I think people behind it have good intentions and I, I probably look into it more. But he he has this with his son. They both have it on their phone. And if one of them slips up, it will immediately go to the other person um, and they'll know. And so that each week they get a progress report, too, of like, here's some maybe some risque images that they came across in their feed that they lingered on or stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, uh it's kind of sad that a lot of people are shaming it into, uh, I think the headline was like, uh, father, uh, is trying to get his son involved with his pornography watching or something like that. It was, it was, they really, somebody's just, always going to figure a way to spin. Right. It, it. it was, it was such a pure message of like accountability between father and son and raising them. Right. And then it, so that, that yeah. frightens me too, is any kind of thing you do to mediate against it is also challenged. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it, that is, that is true. And I think it's even more important today with online presence and everybody being able to know everybody that you're able to keep a large portion of your life to yourself, to your immediate family. And that includes the children. And, you know, I, I've got neighbors that I truly love and their kids who are, who are older and, and, you know, just trying to speak with them about, our lives and, and how it was like when we were younger, cause we didn't have to deal with these necessary, uh, so necessary, like, uh, societal pressures and, and the things that are going on today with, I mean, society has always been bad, but it seems that it does continue to get worse. And, and that, um, the things of where kids are being raised at today are things that we never really had to go through. And that's yeah. because everybody's life is out in front of everyone else's with, all the social media platforms and, and then you've got, you know, YouTube and and TikTok and Instagram and, and all these other things, uh, how you can say it now and that it'll probably change as things change. And as, as your child grows, but how do you growing up in the society now plan to be able to address these things with your child and be able to, um, help them walk through in, the Christian like life that we're obviously going to want our children to, to try and lead. Right. Well, first answer, family accounts, big thing. A lot of people don't know about them. Yep. Um, <laughs> if we're talking games, we're talking social media, we're talking anything that goes online and has access to anything that could be like harmful. You can set up family accounts to where it doesn't restrict access necessarily, but you can still monitor what mm-hmm. they're doing. Uh, so as an example, steam, You can set up a family account where you can have it on their computer. Main account's there. They can do whatever they want. They can buy games if they want to buy games with their own money. doesn't matter, but I can go in whenever I want and look at what they have. Yeah. They can't really hide that. So that's a big thing. Uh, So family accounts. And then another thing is probably just not letting them have a lot of social media to begin with. I personally don't have a lot. Uh, My wife will claim I have an Instagram (laughs) I don't really, <laughs> I have an account that I use to get some, uh, you know, uh, win a raffle for, uh, my Christian summer camp. Mm-hmm. That was it. Uh, I don't use it. I don't have any information on it. Uh, nope. I don't have a lot of other social media. I don't have a Twitter. Don't have anything like that. Um, I, I try to keep my personal online presence under my name as empty and clean as it can be. Right. <laughs> um, but So I I do have a YouTube though, and I love YouTube, but it's a problem. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what are you most fearful about? I mean, because so, I mean, that's like, I'm married and we're obviously having the conversation of like, 
when do we have a kid? Mm -hmm. What do we prepare for? Uh, Because obviously you can never be fully prepared, but what are the things that we can be prepared for when we have a kid? And we're already going through conversations before we're even ready at the moment to like, how are we going to parent? How are we going to prioritize each other? How are we going to prioritize our individual time together, our individual time with the Lord, and then our together time with the Lord as a family, Mm -hmm. meals, things like that. Like, is that something that you guys have talked about? And, and, and do you plan to mimic anything that, that you're reading, you know, Jesus and the disciples tell you on, on how to, to lead a family? Well, so, um, a couple things to touch on there. So one is we talked about it a probably moderately when we were dating before we even got married. Mm-hmm. Um, just because the only thing I ever wanted to be was a dad. So that's, that's what good. I set my entire life up for. Um, and I found a woman who would agree with me that I needed to be the head of the household and would agree that spiritually I'm leading the family and would agree that family time is important. Um, I, I think we both have the same understanding of family dinners um, being very important of just everyone sit down around the, you know, the table and eat and talk to each other and just exist together, which is big. We're big into board games, started our collection early, Nice. Uh, got way too much. Happy dinosaurs or sad dinosaurs is the newest one. Pretty good. Okay. Um, card game, but, uh, and then, um, I guess, uh, big thing, uh, would probably be just our involvement in bringing them to church. Uh, one, uh, going to church on Sundays, um, but my wife is Catholic, so uh, we go to church on Sundays and Saturday nights we go to Mass. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would probably be going to her, with her on that. Um, and, and then just, you know, uh, just kind of showing God's love through us, really, uh, and teaching them where appropriate. I'm not too worried uh, that I don't have a great answer for that yet. Yeah. Because it's they can't understand me until they're like two, so... I'll be all right yeah. till then. No, that's yeah. No, you you're not wrong. <laughs> I'm uh, definitely gonna lean on some friends <laughs> like the days and the diters for better advice. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good elderly statesman advice to be passed around at right. Overland Park Community Church. Yeah. Um. So, planning to have a kid. We've got we've got these ideas on kind of how we want to shape at least our the the family homes. But let's, what was it like as a kid for you growing up and maybe some of like the takeaways that, because I mean, me personally, I've been through some things and, and know exactly the type of person that I want to be or don't want to be. I think, I think I know more of the things that I don't want to do as a father more than I know the things that I actually want to do. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what, tell me a little bit about younger Jack and what, it was like growing up in your household. Was it involved in the church? Did you know the Lord? When did you come to know? Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of like how how that younger life looked. Yeah, so little Jack was a rapscallion. Uh, I had a I'm twin not brother. Surprised. Uh, our nicknames were Seek and Destroy. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I grew up, uh, so born in Kentucky uh, to my parents uh, who were both religious, uh, both Christian. We went to Sunday every, or sorry, church every Sunday. Um, and then, uh, we really got involved, uh, in a church in New Mexico when we moved there when I was six, uh, named Cottonwood, now Anchor Point. Um, Mm -hmm. but, um, so right away, you know, children's service, um, and learning more about God youth group, uh, on Wednesdays, uh, same night actually is here. Weird how that works. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were actually really, uh, inspiring, uh, on just how to teach your kids about the Lord. Uh, my dad would have been a pastor if it was his calling. Uh, he just never got called. (laughs) He wanted to build his life around it. And his, his pastor told him, God will let you know if you need to be a pastor, go to college. (laughs) Um, but, uh, so he was heavily involved in the church. Uh, A couple of times he would preach, uh, throughout the year on a sermon that was really touching him. Um, so he was a great example. Um, and then, uh, what, 2009, because I think I actually dug up my baptism certificate. Nice. Is when I uh, made my original commitment uh, mm-hmm. to God, uh, that uh, I knew him 
pretty well, I thought. Uh, I knew what the commitment was. Right. And I knew that I wanted to be more like my dad. So um, I made the commitment then. Um, and then, you know, going through middle school, high school, youth group, uh, helping out in the church. I was on the uh, uh, the IT group at the church. And so I was running cameras half the time. Um, and then I also worked out in children's ministry. Uh, so I was a high schooler hanging out with, like, five-year-olds in the church as an assistant for the class. Mm -hmm. I just love kids, man. But, uh, <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, so my twin brother got cancer in high school. Uh, and then, uh, throughout high school from freshman year to junior year, uh, he was in, in and out of remission a bunch. Um, but he kept coming back strong. That's when I kind of, started pulling away a bit, uh, started just like trying to focus more in on school and, uh, football, rugby work mm -hmm. really didn't want to acknowledge it at all, uh, how I was growing distant. Um, and then senior year, uh, my brother passed away. Um, and that hit real hard. Um, I never renounced the belief in Christ. I, uh, just didn't want anything to do with him. Cause he really made me mad. <laughs> um, it, you know, it was one of those things of just pure anger mm -hmm. towards the situation, but misplaced in God. Of course. Um, I think a I, lot of people have been down that same road. Right. It's, I mean, it's hard not to be upset with God when something like that happens, especially after, you know, three years of in and out of mm -hmm. it. It's gone. No, it's not. It's gone. It's no, it's not. It's back. And it just really tears you up. Uh, I mean, I didn't have a, I didn't have my parents around in high school a lot because they were dealing with either my sister from school or they were at the hospital with my brother. So it was like, you grow up quick and uh, you kind of push away what, you know, what you were taught when you were younger with God because it's not working at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really have a good foundation to, to keep me on that track. Yeah. Um, so then I, uh, kind of, you know, pushed it all aside, finished out my senior year of high school. Um, really apathetic about it all. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time. Wasn't good for me. Uh, Rarely but, is. Yeah. Uh, it was, she was getting really upset that I was going to Texas for college. Um, cause she was staying in New Mexico. Um, and, uh, I, I did keep my virginity, uh, into up to that point. Um, I went out to college, uh, and I just continued having a terrible time. Um, I continued to stray from the Lord probably during this time. I just wasn't even listening to podcasts or anything about it. Mm -hmm. I was completely just, I'm done. Um, I would, I would, uh, I'd really lean on my girlfriend at the time. I was on phone calls with her for like four hours a day. Um, so I really wasn't getting the college experience either. <laughs> it was pretty much just going to class, yeah. going back to the dorm and getting on the phone. Um, and then uh, I finally had enough of her constantly like telling her or telling me she hated me for moving and all that. I had enough. I broke up with her uh, in that spring. Um, and then I went into a real spiral. Um, it was, it was, it was not a good time for me. Uh, I failed four classes out of the five I was taking. One of them I should have passed, but I slept through an exam. Um, but it was, it was just real bad. Uh, cause I had been putting that all on her and then I now had nothing. No one, you know, I, I thought it was over cause one, I would never find a girl that knew my brother anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which was a big hit. And then I finally was dealing with all the grief of missing you know, your twin part of you. Um, and so, uh, I can clearly remember myself driving home that spring, uh, right after the spring semester. Um, I, I always did my drives overnight cause it saves time, uh, less cops out on the road, mm -hmm. go a little faster. Um, I was apathetic about life. It wasn't suicidal, but I was constantly just like, I'm tired, but I'm not pulling over. Like if it happens, it happens. I'm, right. I'm just so done. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, actually a really good friend of mine kind of helped me out of that that summer. 
uh, I, I went into therapy. Uh, I only had two sessions, but that's really all I needed because uh, I'm a quick learner. Uh, <laughs> but and then I started meeting with my pastor, uh, and then a really good friend of mine, Kevin Howe, uh, started hanging out with me. And he's a godly man too. He struggled with all of that I struggled, but like five years prior to me, not the uh, brother side of it, yeah. but but definitely a lot of the uh, you know mental health issues and girlfriends that you know are really toxic and then breaking that link um and uh that was really good for me just to have that support structure to fall back on Mm -hmm. um i didn't fully come back uh to the lord i stopped at least being upset with him um and i i started to just try and look back at the the time i did have with my brother um and then went back for the fall semester really focused on grades um because you know by this time i had a what a 0.98 gpa so i was in i was on probation right but at a and m to in engineering you have to get into a major after your after two years in general engineering um and if you don't do that you get kicked out um so I was really focusing that fall semester on grades, trying to get my grades back up to above a 2.0 so I could apply for a major. Um, and uh, fall went fine. Spring, I started uh, going to a church uh, called Antioch uh, up there. Uh, and I went to the life group mostly. I didn't go to the church itself because I didn't like the the leaders. And it mm-hmm. felt very seed churchy, yeah. which I'm not a big fan of those that are just like... Um, our only goal is to send a bunch of people out all over the place and set up churches. We're not here for family or community. Mm-hmm. It's just you come here, give us some money, and then we're going to put another church down somewhere else. Seemed like a Ponzi scheme. But um, so I started getting into a life group there, started developing a relationship with God again, uh, started talking to him more. Um, and then that spring semester, I needed to get a 3.4 to stay in college and be able to apply for a major. Um, and which just got me above a 2.0 cumulative. Um, and then, uh, it was, I think probably halfway into the semester, I got a call from Kevin Howell. Um, and, uh, he was like, Hey, this camp I, uh, worked at last summer. And then I'm, uh, he was doing a, a discipleship program there for a year. Uh, he was like, we're looking for camp counselors you should just come uh, for the summer. I mean, even if you don't feel comfortable, you know, talking to the kids about God, I'm sure we need help just running the camp. And I was like, that sounds great. Um, And so I had plans for the summer finally. um, And uh, I just started praying more and more on passing uh, the, uh, pass my classes uh, just to get through. Um, And then that summer was life changing. Um, for sure. I, uh, so I had already met Sarah at this point, but we were just newly dating, uh, and we hadn't been really involved in talking about religion mm-hmm. by that point. We just knew each other. We're, I was Christian. She was Catholic, but which I guess I was Protestant. She was Catholic, <laughs> but, um, but I, when I went to that summer, it was <laughs> night and day. Um, I, I finally started, uh, seeing, uh, just God everywhere. I saw it in the fellow camp counselors and the campers. Um, it was nice to be in nature, uh, and get away from cities. Uh, and then most importantly, I was looking back, at what had happened with my brother one night and I just kind of realized all of the good that God actually did in his life. Um, you know, uh, just, he, he used to be apathetic about God even before he had cancer. And then when he had cancer, he, just immediately changed. Like he was bringing people from our school to church. He ended up baptizing one of our friends all while going through chemo, losing a leg, losing his hair, just constantly helping out at the church and constantly just getting more involved. Um, And uh, and even through, you know, the non church side of it, uh, he started, um, well, I guess my parents started it, but he did a charity uh, that would help fund cancer research um, and started helping out at the hospital and, uh, you know, he was in the children's area. So you got kids with leukemia in there. Um, he'd constantly get kids out of their room to walk down the halls and do their PT. 
Um, so just the, the, the way God came into his life, mm -hmm. even in that terrible time right. and made a difference and made an impact was huge. And all while you're on the other side, right. So on the, on, yeah. on the other side, just Going away. watching this. And it's funny how we realize it after the fact. Right. Right. And I, I constantly hear that story where mm -hmm. it's, Grief is happening. The person that the grief is happening to is finding the Lord or finding happiness, letting it go, while the other side can't let that person go and they're letting everything else kind of slip away. And so you're kind of in that same boat where right. your brother is finding everything and you're just letting life kind of slip away. You, you talked about it a little bit, but dig into that a little bit deeper for me. What, what was that really like? What were the emotions, um, that you were kind of going through and, and how was it that you went from being younger and on fire for the Lord to just nowhere? Um, I mean, I'm not a very emotional, well, I'm emotional. I'm not very introspective about my emotions. Yes. Um, and so it, I guess it'd be hard for me to talk on that <laughs> a little bit, but I can try a little. Um, just, you know, going from a kid that's always happy and kind of knows what's going on to someone who seldom is, uh, you, you know, I'm putting on a an act out in public, but when I got back home to the dorm or uh, sophomore year, a little bit, uh, back to the house. I was just alone in, in the room, just doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I was not interacting with anyone. Uh, maybe I was playing games, but I wasn't like building connections. I was lonely. Um, I was, I was depressed a lot. Uh, it, did you feel trapped? I didn't feel trapped because I had, I could go wherever I wanted to go. Like nothing was keeping me not, anywhere. not like, um, being kept somewhere, but like emotionally you were trapped I in, in a state of <laughs> that you couldn't necessarily work out of because of what you had going on around you. Again, I'm not introspective. Oh, I wouldn't yeah. be able to know what that's like. <laughs> Fair. Um, it just was, I just didn't have a lot of fun. That's all yeah. I know. It's like, it just, it was very sad and lonely and, you know, it, 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 you know, cause like I said, I, I wasn't suicidal. I was just apathetic about life. Mm. So it was like, I'm not going to do anything to harm myself, but I'm also not going to do anything to, you know, protect myself or to keep myself from doing dumb things. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of just like giving up. It's it, you're just an autopilot. You're not really uh, thinking much about it all. Yeah, but I could also see it from the other side. I would, f I would fare to say that the disciples were also apathetic in a way of they're not going to keep themselves out of harm's way. Keeping yourself out of harm's way in terms of that to like no, do the I'm Lord's not, work versus no, keeping yes. yourself out of harm's way, like <laughs> taking a 30 minute nap on the side of the road at two in the morning, no. right? So. <laughs> Yeah. Two completely yeah. different things. Two completely <laughs> different things. But I think it I think the sentiment is still yeah. the same where it's it, it's there there's two there's always two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. where no matter what the emotion is or the feeling is, is that sometimes you just have to turn it over. You were in an apathetic way, but but then retrospectively when you get now and you're looking back at that time, you are seeing yourself as somewhat trapped. But uh I mean, yeah, if I look at it, if now, you look back I, I at it now, say that's go, what I felt in the time. Right. right. But looking back at it retrospectively, you would say that you were trapped while your brother was out there living free. And so there, there's two sides of the same coin. He knows that it's going to end, but living more freely where you are looking at it, ending and staying trapped. Right. When there is still freedom that could be gained on that side. I and it's the same way of like the disciples of Jesus. They know that there's two sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it that way. Maybe I need to hit that third session. <laughs> 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 yeah third yeah. session might not be too bad <laughs> yeah i all i know is i, I kind of cheered up and stopped kind of started letting god back in and that's when i was like okay there peace for chumps i'm out <laughs> but yeah no that's that's cool um 
of the therapy and like finding, finding yourself again, it's, it's not for everybody, but knowing right. that you were able um, to find something out of it while some people think they don't find anything out of it. But in reality, what people will do is they will get stuck in the cycle of therapy. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas it, this right here is the truth. Not that therapy, somebody can't help talk you out of things, but when you realize that it's not somebody who's helping ground you, it's this right, right here, the Bible, if for those of you that are on audio, <laughs> it's the Bible that I'm holding here is that that is what grounds you. Right. And it's all about being grounded and finding the newness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's always a newness. Right. And I, I think that is, again, I, I would, that's a great point is cycle of therapy. Uh, therapy is great because they just teach you how to talk about what you're going through and telling you that it's okay to feel that way, but it's not okay to live that way. And you know, that that's sometimes all you need to hear. And then you're ready to get back on track. That's, yeah, no. And I, I mean, think that if a... you keep going back and you're just like, well, I got this issue. We'll try this. Well, that didn't work. And so I'm going to just keep doing the same stuff I always do. And I think that's a valid point when it comes to we're talking about discipleship group, mm -hmm. where we talked about <clears throat> having the the responsibility or an accountability of other men in the group or the women in the group um, is that that also teaches us how to talk and critically think through our problems. But the one thing it does better than therapy is walks you through the life of Jesus mm -hmm. and the life of the apostles and figuring out exactly what it is that they're saying um, and having the accountability to do so and not so much talk your way through it, but critically think your way into, okay, I have wrapped and warped my mind around so many different things that I don't know what to do. And so instead of talking yourself through things, you're now speaking those things to the Lord and handing them over. And now you come to a full release, that full release that your brother found. Mm -hmm. I think I have. I'm always questioning that though. <laughs> Which portion? The, the full release, you know, uh, I don't, although I don't know if that's a, a mixture of it's good to be a little hard on yourself when it comes to that and trying to examine yourself. But then also, you know, you look at people further along in their journeys and their walks and that kind of a little discouraging. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> you're like, man, maybe I'm faking it, but you know? Yeah, um, no, I think, I think you're you're right that there's a lot of faking it, um, and it, I th the hardest part is giving up control, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a season of life that you're going to head into here very shortly. Yeah. That giving up control is you're not going to want to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can I I have this problem without children that I don't, right. and I'm you you as well in the moment, but you're going to go into a, a season where you don't, you won't have control, mm -hmm. but you're going to continue to try and obtain it. Right. And that's going to be a season of like, okay, we've just got to give it up. We've mm -hmm. got to get into the word. And that's also a very fearful season. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm terrified uh, of past April. Cause I don't know what's going to happen with all yeah. that. So yeah. I'm worried. Uh, but a lot of different things. I uh, I'm, right now I'm trying to. What well, my wife's working and I'm working. Mm -hmm. After April, she won't be working. So <laughs> having to yeah. just make sure that that's all good and uh, I trust that it will be. But there's some doubt in that trust. <laughs> you know? Yeah, tell me about that. Tell, um, tell me, tell me yeah. about the doubt because so, it's important. I mean, I just bought a house. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper than renting, but um. I don't know. It's always, I'm always worried if I'm making the right financial decisions and I want a stay at home mom for my child mm -hmm. and she wants to be a stay at home mom. And I, I know I can do it, but I'm so worried the second the child comes out, things are going to go wrong and I'm going to start paying for different things out the wazoo. Like, Oh, foundation slips or, Oh, uh, you know, car accident or child need, has a bunch of medical bills that were unforeseen. You know, it, I'm worried about that, you know? Um, so that's the, and, and losing that second income mm -hmm. for that, that's scary. Cause I can, 
I can do it on one. It's just, it's not as comfortable and it's not as secure. <laughs> yeah. What is, I've heard of all the things that you're afraid of. Where's the doubt? What are we doubting? Oh, okay. We're so doubting we're it our- in this because okay. we talked about it earlier. <laughs> I'm not doubting if it can, if, if God can do what he says he'll do. And if he'll, you know, um, or sorry, if he can, um, you know, protect me and my family, it is, will he, or why would he? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, what the, you see the chosen? Yeah. Yeah. Season, I watched the chosen. Last episode of season four. Uh, uh, don't think we've gotten to season four yet. But right, that's spoilers okay. That's alert. okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about it anyways, cause it's a great example. Uh, when Peter's, you know, commanded to get out of the boat yes. and walk on the water, um, and you know, in the in the chosen, they have such a cinematic and like very dramatic uh, version of this. And Peter's just like, I'm not, I'm not, uh, aff- like I, I have faith that you can do this. Mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, I don't have faith that you will. Like for me, like why me? Um, and this, I believe, the chosen. Uh, this was after what uh, his uh, wife had a miscarriage. Okay. Um, do you know, Corey, you don't watch the show? I think that's what it is, but it was not like that. He didn't have faith that it could be done. It's that, why would he do it for me? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just, that's always in the back of my head. Uh, cause I'm not, I know I'm not the most on fire for the Lord. And I know I'm not the, you know, the, the biggest servant in OPCC or even in my discipleship group for him. So then it's like, well, maybe he's got to help them first or, you know, that's, that's really, maybe, maybe maybe it is his will that I go through this, right? (laughs) Yeah, no, I I mean, maybe that is the plan. I think that is really funny that it comes, it comes full circle here, at least with those who have been attending Sunday service for the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. It's been the theme, right? You know what I'm going to say? Faith of a mustard seed. Yeah. Jimmy's been talking yeah. about it. We've, we've been reading it, <laughs> yeah. right? It's, and I get it. There's that doubt. Like this is uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but I think when we look back in our lives and we look back and we see the areas in which we were most vulnerable, the areas which we were most scared and had the most doubt, mm-hmm. well, those were the times in which the Lord provided the most. Right. I think every, everybody can do that. And, and, Again, you're looking at it retroactively. You're not mm-hmm. looking at it in the moment. When you're out of it, you look back and you see the life lessons that the Lord has provided and how you can now overcome way more than you could oh, yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and it and it takes, like Jesus said, have the faith the size of a mustard seed. It'll come out. It doesn't. That doesn't mean it's going to come out the way that we want it to. Oh, yeah. That's not the yeah. plan for us. And but and that's also the what makes aspect. it. And that's <laughs> the control aspect. It's about yeah. giving it away. <laughs> and it's so. It's so so hard. I have those conversations mm-hmm. with my wife as well because, you know, we we have been through through these things um, of releasing control, and then like now we're at a different point. But now we have to give control of that up, and it's different stages of having that faith and. Mm-hmm being trustful in the in the Lord that he's going to take over these pieces. And it just takes that one step, that one little piece of faith, mm-hmm. the size of, I, you could barely hold a mustard seed in my hand, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it's just that one little piece to be able to walk through. Uh, and it's difficult, mm-hmm. man. Let me tell you, I am scared every single time that I got to give up control. Uh, and that's especially in today's society. Um, that is like one of the few things that I want to give up is control over all the aspects that are going on. Cause mm-hmm. everything out there is just so damaging right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, no, you, <clears throat> make, you make a great point. It's, <laughs> it, it always, it sounds so right. And so like, yeah, I need to do that. But then when you have but then to when do you it, gotta do it, it's you, so hard. <laughs> you're the one who has to give up the control yeah. and you're in the middle of the, you're in the middle of the lion's in, you're in the yeah. middle of the furnace and the fire is coming around and the lion is coming at you and you don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. That is when I think that I, when that happens for me is when I find the most clarity. 
mm-hmm. is because when I am no longer able to take it anymore is when I drop down in prayer the most. Yeah. And I, I, I've been trying to be more cognizant about taking walks and taking prayer walks and like listening to the Bible, not always just reading it, but like absorbing it in the middle of prayer as I walk and, and trying to be cognizant of that portion to work it into my daily life more than just sitting in the fire and leaning on the Lord when it's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that, is something good that I think I could eventually bring to a child whenever, if ever that happens. Yeah, I'm still perfecting that, but <laughs> oh, we're gonna be protect. Per- we're gonna be doing that the rest of our lives. Is yeah. is trying to to perfect that piece, um, and we're never gonna get it right. Mm-hmm. And that's like the good news. So we're never gonna get it right. Right. Well, you can perfect your routine at least. You'll never be able to protect your routine because you're always gonna have an attack from the enemy. Something is always going to happen, especially when you have a kid. The time that you yeah. have set specifically for that now gets ate up. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully not. Mornings before uh, I go to work usually are pretty and good And that me, little but... sucker is crying it Look, every 30 minutes. There's nothing more robust than my morning routine. <laughs> I wake up at the same time every morning, have the same three eggs every morning, Make my lunch the same way every morning. It, it's a robust routine. Hopefully we're we're going to revisit this we'll revisit conversation yeah, in, April, yeah. in April, May. Yeah, we're going to come back I believe I can do this. it. I don't need much sleep. <laughs> We've been on the side I, of the I road before. A, I would do a one-way, or what, two-way, 12 hours each way trip over the weekend to go back home. I, can, I, can, I think I can. Uh, we can figure it out. Yeah. I think I'll get through it, hopefully. I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, watching... Uh, to a couple in our uh, discipleship group just had a kid. They okay. look fine. That's they're good. doing all right, and they're both working. So hey, I feel bad for them. If the Lord puts you to it, he can get you through it. Yeah, <laughs> true. It's, yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite sayings I, I grew up with. It's, I like it. Good saying. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I am excited, though, because I, I do think it'll help me lean on the Lord more. And That'll be good. It's going to put you in a very vulnerable position. Wake-up calls work great on me. So, you know. that's good that phone's gonna be ringing dude you yeah. just wait uh, well jack dude thanks for coming on yeah, this has been wonderful getting to know you we've been around the church for a little bit but i know we we, we uh go to different service times and it's been uh it's been a very very much of a pleasure to to get to know a little bit of your story and and hopefully share it with uh with the yeah, church learn from my mistakes Hey, don't ever, don't ever doubt. God gets you through things. I, I still graduated as an engineer. So yeah, I mean, anything's made possible happen. through God. He made it happen <laughs> for you. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, if, if, uh, at the end of this, you have some things that you want to talk about, or you need a community to reach out to, please reach out to our discipleship director, Grant at overlandpark.cc. We'd be happy to get in touch with you and get you a part of a community Uh, if that is what you're looking for. Uh, But until next time, thank you for listening. Have a blessed week.